black soil and the sun beating on it, if you have it all covered or protected, we're hoping that water going in is obviously cooler. I don't have tests. I haven't tested if the temperature is different, but just thinking black soil and sun versus protection and, and that, you hope the water's cooler. And that's important. Again, this in this particular instance, it flows into uh, a stream that has cell on it, so trout. So. Uh, wildlife friendly fencing. <clears throat> so we've done a bunch of wildlife friendly fencing. It's debatable. It's up to the producer. Some like it, some don't. Uh, some of the old timers we've talked to actually prefer the smooth wire on the bottom because they say if the calf gets out, well, then the calf's going to go back to the cow. I don't have to get out there and push it back underneath the fence. So it's a matter of personal opinion what they prefer to do. There's some that prefer to use smooth wire 18 inches high to facilitate pronghorn movement underneath. Uh, there's some that prefer to do it on their internal fences but not their perimeter fences. Again, it's a matter of personal opinion. Uh, we promote smooth wire uh, because of the impacts it can have on, on pronghorn on their backs. We have a couple of, of videos and pictures that actually show pronghorn with just completely scarred backs uh, and bare skin. And you can see the barbs actually clawing in through them as they're trying to go underneath. We've had producers in the, in the Mini Berries area that uh, has told us that he actually was out there and, and he found there's about 100 pronghorn stuck in one of his fields uh, because the fences weren't were blowing up and it was a bad, it was like 2010, there's snow, there's three feet of snow and flat, you guys can remember 2010. Uh, <coughs> so he opened the gate and as we were standing the, there, the pronghorn just moved out right in front of him. They didn't, didn't carry, they just they got out that way. So I mean, if you can have smooth wire 18 inches high, it can help facilitate that movement. In some cases, Mother Nature, you know, plays havoc and, and there's not much else you can do. Uh, so anyways, that's just some of the things we've done. We've done probably I don't know, 50, 100, probably 100 miles of fence now over the last seven years, 17 years uh, through this process. Uh, another thing we've done is uh, native grass restoration. And so we've seeded back 1,700 acres of native grass. Um, this, is a, this is quite expensive. It's one of the reasons why if you have native grass land, please keep it the right side up. Uh, this can cost, I'm trying to think now, if it was three, I think at the time it was about 350 bucks an acre uh, to see back and, and spray. And you're constantly, you're still, you're still constantly dealing with Canada thistle and, and, and even sweet clover, which is available um, at times. Uh, but if you go to the next one, and you can flip through, yeah, that's the next one too. Yeah. So, uh, what we've done is we've actually seeded about nine pounds per acre uh, into this and we broadcasted it and then heard it. And we just had local, a local producer do this for us. Uh, the first year doesn't look like much. You know, we seeded west wheatgrass, north wheatgrass, June grass, needle thread, and blue grandma. Uh, by the third year, fourth year, it started looking like, like this. And uh, that's important. Uh, we, of course, we've got a, some luck, right? There's some, some moisture considerations to, to think about. Uh, but we have cattle grazing it, and we have uh, sprays pipits using the site now. We actually had a tour just this past year that uh, Environment Canada, Ministry of Saskatchewan, and some of the SODCAP, uh, Kelly and Adrian, I think Adrian, Adrian, mm -hmm. came out. And uh, we walked to the middle of one of our reseeds, and uh, we are looking at it, and we got all the people surrounded. As I was about to talk, a Sprigs pipit started to call. And it wasn't planned. I got accused of planting a speaker somewhere in the grass because it was perfectly timed. But no, a Sprigs pipit was calling. It was all, it was kind of nice. The cattle had just finished grazing. It was, it was a great, great uh, scene, I guess, to have it timed perfectly. So, uh, finally, like uh, Catherine mentioned, we do install uh, Ferruja's hawk poles. We don't install Ferruja's hawk poles in the EPO area. We don't install Ferruja's hawk poles in uh, any areas where we know where we do surveys ahead of time for sharp tailed grouse lacks or burrowing owl burrows, right? We try most of them go in spots where there's no one trees that have fallen down or nests that have collapsed over time. Uh, we have partnerships with uh, with Fortis, Elf Link, and Equus, a bunch of the utility and power line companies that will go and put these uh, hawk poles up for us in kind, which is great because we can use that in kind dollars to uh, go in and get other partner dollars for that, right? So any kind funds are useful that way. If you click the next one, why do we do why do we do hot poles? Well, this is a case where we've had a 
We had a producer that has watched a frozen hawk nest in a little windy little tree. And the first year they watched him, and then about mid-April, the, the nest blew down, and one of our, you know, leopards is a little windy sometimes, so blew down, and uh, everything was lost, nothing, nothing survived. So, the next year, Fruits Hawks came back, they nested in that same tree again, oh, let's build there again, right? Well, what happened? Well, in April, it blew down, and nothing survived. So, the, the, the producers were quite disheartened, they wanted to see these hawks in the land, so they got a hold of us, and we talked to Fiss and Wildlife. And we actually took the, the Fruzzles Hawk nest and we put it on the platform and we put the pole about 600 meters from where it was. And the hawks came back the next year, nested there right away, produced four young that flexed. So you can kind of imagine this is an endangered species in Alberta. So you can see what was lost those past two years, right? And so they produced four, three to four young uh, each year now for the past four or five years, I guess, since the pole's been up. So it's, uh, Great success story. The reason, the importance of having the producers on the ground, uh, noticing a problem and doing something about it. Right. So again, just another reason for why it's important to have these these people on the ground doing the work they do. Um, this is also the poll. If you ever go on to, uh, is it on the yes, the ACA website? Uh, there's Fruce's Hawk camera. This is the poll that actually has a camera on it, and so you can see when the hawks come back and the young. And we had a whole bunch of photos from last year. I think they produced four young again last year as well in this poll. So last slide, I think. So what? So this program, again, it's been around for 17 years. We still work with every producer that we started working with back 17 years ago. Okay, so we've gone back. Some of these producers have had one, two, two, two or three reassessments now uh, since we first started with them, and they continue to want to work with us. So that, I hope that speaks volumes to the way we, we collaborate with producers. Uh, we have 46 habitat conservation strategies working on about 40, 440,000 acres and we got about 66,000 or 63,000 acres uh, that, of producers that have signed up for 2019 already. Uh, we have another four producers that have actually acquired already for 2020, which is another capacity to put them in this year. We do, uh, we have 82 SART plans, so these are very quick plans where uh, a biologist might go out, talk to the producer over coffee, and uh, go tour the property and talk about different ideas that producers have, uh, very simplistic means, and, and provide ideas for habitat for different species of risk. It's a very quick, quick uh, means of going out and engaging more producers. Eventually, some of these may, may come into the more detailed habitat conservation strategies. The other one is uh, we also have the 20 BMPs. Are, there's still producers that, you know, I, I'm just interested in the hawk pole. Or I'm just interested in doing something with northern leopard frogs. And so we'll go and, and work with those producers as well and uh, implement specific habit, habitat enhancements for, for those species. Uh, finally, uh, range information. So that the range information we've collected, so on the plant communities, not the range health, but the plant communities, is very important. It helps with our plant community guides, which we can use to help identify the different reference plant communities and use that information. We're currently working on and monitoring about 160 enhancements now uh, that have been implemented across those those acres that I mentioned for the past 17 years. So with that, thank you all for, for listening to me ramble, and uh, I'd be pleased to answer any questions if there are some. Thank you. Okay. Do you ever work with First Nations? We have. We, we've uh, done, was there one property? That was completed. The blood, the blood drive. We've gone out and trained. Them. So they, they've asked us. They actually went out and did some training with them the one year. This is yeah. before you started, probably. Then this is with Francois. Okay, yeah. that's probably. <laughs> um, so we have gone down, gone out and helped do some training uh, with their their own environmental group. And we've done one uh, assessment uh, with, uh, with one of the one of the band members on their. There might be some future collaborations too because we have been contacted by them. The, the Blood Tribe near Lethbridge is starting to do a whole bunch of range surveys and wildlife surveys on their land. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're talking about introducing bison at, at some point. So there may be some more opportunities for collaborations with them. I have a question. Do you uh, have any projects with invasive wound management, like especially your habitat improvement? Yeah, we've, uh, oh, 
we have a bunch. There's, there's, we do biocontrol, right? We have we have a number of sites that have biocontrols. I think most of them have worked. There's some yeah. that have it. Uh, biocontrols. We provide uh, chemicals for spot spraying okay. as well. For uh, it's nice because when the girologists go out and when the biologists are out, we'll if we come across a patch of leafy spurge or or anything like that, we'll mark it, right? And so that information is all available to the, the producer as well. And then uh, yeah, we'll buy some of the chemical or we'll put the, the bugs out of those spots too. And your biocontrol, is it mainly just like the spurge? Dalmatian toad flax, oh, okay. <coughs> and can of beetles? Beetles, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so a few of them. Okay, thanks. What do you have your uh, <coughs> range assessments? On some of your older properties or first properties, mm -hmm. now, I'm not talking about the riparian areas, but this is the range. If you noticed a lot of difference, like has it changed much? Or? There'll be little, there'll be areas that will go down and areas that go up, and it, it fluctuates. But when you look at the average rain health, range health scores, right, over for the whole property, it basically goes like this, right? And so I think for me, in my opinion, I mean, I think it tells. Tells a lot. So as a producer, my health, and, and that we also look at litter and we look at row balance. So things haven't changed, like it's staying the same. But the grassland birds, in some cases, are going like this, right? I just find that it's, I find that interest, right? Because from a producer standpoint, I I'm controlling the grassland. I'm doing I'm doing all I can, right? I have the grassland that looks great. The birds are are decreasing. So is that outside my control, right? What else can I do as a producer? Um, they most of these species, they migrate, right? They go down south, they migrate, they go to wintering grounds. Um, so I think it's important as a producer to have that baseline. These are what I have. My, I'm doing my thing. My habitat is, this is my habitat. It's, it's maintaining. The birds just aren't coming back. So I find, that, I find that interesting, I guess. We're looking at more things. We don't look at insects. So we're, we want to look, we're interested in starting looking more into the entomology and looking at insects and trying to understand that relationship. Uh, but from a, from a, looking at the litter and, the, and everything, it seems to be not, not significant change. So Will the environment have a big impact on that though too? If it don't rain for three years. You betcha. You betcha. It's going to go like this. Yeah, yeah. You bet. But it's interesting. Even though it, even though it hasn't rained, they're still, their, their house has, has been maintained pretty good over those years. It's impressive actually, right? So, uh, but you're right. I mean, you got to factor all that stuff, right? If you have a two-year, three-year drought, you, you got your when your agrologist goes in, uh, you got to recognize that kind of stuff. Too. Yeah. So in that case, Brad, are you seeing that when you have the the really heterogeneous landscapes, the real mosaics, that you might see a decline in one species depending on yep. the cycles, but an increase in other species then? Yep, that's that's the thing, right? We get into the wet cycles and mm -hmm. sort of species pop up, and then you go into the dry cycles, and maybe some other things improve. It's kind of, you know, it's yeah. The climate has a big climate has a big big role in it. So, mm -hmm. okay. so, so as a land holder, it'd be quite important to have that baseline. Yes. To uh, protect yourself, basically. <laughs> I find there's producers that like having it for due diligence. Exactly, they love having that. <laughs> Because it sows, I provide habitat because there's a list of wildlife species in the back. There's a list of plants. This is what my rats provide. This is what I have, right? And then five years from now, I still have all these species. Maybe a little bit lower numbers, but I still have them. But my my management has uh, no significant change in my my man, like the habitat, right? It's 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 being maintained. I think that's important to have, right? Just to have that baseline. Very to important. One. Yeah. And you, if you have to give one number on the, that is, you say that you make assessment of habitat every five years. Yeah. Um, how successful are to move from one condition to another one? For example, from red uh, color habitat to a yellow one, or the yellow one to to the green. Uh, in which percentage you, you think that is uh, uh, after applying your recommendations uh, are moving are improving the habitat so yeah we I mean we have we have recommendations that we've all agreed to as a team 
it's up to the producer. producer still can decide, you know what, I'm going to do this one. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm going to try something else, right? It's, it's, you know, it's good faith, I guess. It's information for them to use the way they want. Um, we've, can, we've seen, uh, you know, it's over. If we go and do assessments each year, then we can have a better idea and see those, those changes over, over the year. If you go back every five years, we've seen red areas go back to green areas. We've seen green areas go down, not to red, but to like yellow, orange areas. But other areas in that same field may go to green. It's just about our distribution and, and, and all that, right? So that's why you like looking at the overall picture of the ranch, right? Because you're still going to have those unhealthy areas. It's just a matter of shifting around where those areas are, right? Um, so yeah, so I mean, you, you'll see those changes. It's nice when we have a specific enhancement done on the ground. It's nice to go back to that specific site every year and you can actually see it on a yearly basis, the changes that are going on. Um, especially like that one where you do an upland watering site. It's, it's, you know, you expect, okay, we expect that we're going to see lower litter amounts and because it's, it's a more of a sacrifice area, an area that cattle are going to congregate on. What are the species of wildlife we're going to also see there as well? So mm -hmm. hope that answers to you. And also, how the ranchers go in the program? That is, you can, they ask to be part of the multi-star program or you select some areas that are ecological? It's funny, it's funny. It's, I've seen, a, I've seen a, a complete shift over the last 17 years. And that's all because of <coughs> uh, word of mouth from local producers, talk to the neighbors, and promoted the program from the grassroots up, right? We don't advertise lots. We don't. Uh, when we first started, there was a lot of cold calling and, and talking to producers and, and seeing who would like to work with us. And we were very fortunate. We got our first producer to decide to work with us. All his neighbors thought he was crazy. <laughs> what are you doing working with these? Oh, geez. And we work with all those neighbors now, by the way. So, but it, it takes one person usually to, to step and say, oh, I'll try. And, uh, and having those early adopters again also help guide the program and, and make it work for in a way that producers would find beneficial right that's key uh, so nowadays we have producers we don't have to go do many presentations i don't think we did any of this year we did one but we were we were asked to go do it uh, and producers call us and ask if they you know if they're interested in learning more and being a part of the program so it's gone from cold calls to now producers calling us and asking to be a part of the program let's say which is a maintenance is great to see that that shift uh, in, in that respect. Yeah. Your uh, grass assessment is it still based on ungrazed grass, like your hundred percent or totally healthy grass? No, I mean they'll they'll survey it after the cattle graze too. Is that what you're talking? Like they'll well, be... a lot of the grass surveys, like uh, the one they did at home, it come in seventy five percent or eighty eight. Yeah. Uh, with problems, but it's grazed grass. Eh? Yeah. So when they go into areas that have never been grazed, well, then they give a hundred percent or a, a rating, eh? which isn't a, really right. Yeah. You need, <laughs> you need a agrologist here. I'm just a bio. Um, <laughs> but well, basically, what they look for is even on a graze system, though, my understanding is that I mean, you're still going to have a lot of the the key grasses there, right? You're still going to be able to identify all the key. So the reference community still matches that, and even, and so that's, and they can still do a, a we, we have sites that have been in the 80s, the 100s that are already grazed, um, because the plant community's there, they still have the litter amounts, all that stuff. We've had places that ha haven't been grazed that may not be 80, because of the, the plant community that's there doesn't match what a reference plant community should be. So you might have like the bad word, downy brome, uh, or other invasive species into it, and so that can affect the community. Uh, the litter may just not be there from previous years, right? So the litter build up, and so you can, again, kind of girls can explain it better than I can, but, but that's, you know, those are some of the things. So just because it's grazed, uh, or if it's not grazed, they should be able to do the same type of assessment. That's my, that's my understanding. It's kind of based on a reference community, not just grazing. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Because no, that's I that's guess that's my that's point that. is that prairie grass was always great. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So to give a perfectly healthy uh, grass uh, system, like a 70 with problems, or you know, it's, it, it doesn't make sense eh? because yeah. it, it always has been grazed. Yeah. And 
probably depends if there's weeds or not weeds or invasive species or what the plant community. Again, they're basing it on a soil type. They're basing it on uh, in this typical well, soil type. This is the plant community you would find. And so if if you have say higher amounts of blue gramma grass or the community seems to be different, then that's where the scores can fluctuate. Even though it's all native, it's grazed, and that's my. Yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. I was a virologist, Randy. <laughs> I've been out a lot with them, but yeah. yeah. I would just like to see it change to be more accurate. Like raised grass. Like, like, well, you raise a good point, though, Randy, and I think one of the things that I'm starting to hear in conversations and 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 we're pushing for too is challenging these these assessments because there is no one fit solution and having you know it's great to have a bunch of keen staff go out there and follow this guy to do an assessment but it's it's not accounting for a lot of factors as well and and one of the hardest things to to swallow as just the surveyor self is you go out and you see that the plant community is is really really um, narrowed down and you've got 3,000 pounds of litter and that you think that would be pristine and beautiful but actually it's, it isn't because it's not being grazed and the diversity has gone down so I think at the end of the day it's about the header that, that mm -hmm. image of that map that shows a whole bunch of different things going on. Yeah, you see you could have huge litter scores right but yeah, is it a monoculture now because it's choked everything out? Yeah. And that's what I, mean. I think it needs some adjustment. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think this is yours. <coughs> I also, Brad, an apology. I said he's been with Alberta Conservation Association for seven years. It's been 17. 17, I know. Old enough. I look young. <laughs> <man. laughs> so sorry about that, Brad. <laughs> Our next presenter, um, Maggie, came all the way in from Accord, Saskatchewan. Um, so Maggie is the rangeland ecologist at Grasslands National Park yeah. and in this role she oversees the programs relating to grazing, restoration and invasive species management and prior to taking this role at the park um, she was the program representative for the Species at Risk Farm Program for Simply Agricultural Solutions working with producers who were interested in implementing beneficial management practices for species at risk on their land. And Maggie lives south of McCord with her husband on a mixed farm, and she's looking forward to spring. So with that, I'll turn it over to Maggie. Hey, Just give me a nod when it's time to flip the slides. <laughs> I might walk over and flip them myself, too. Sure, you do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about uh, implementing the Multi-Species at Risk Action Plan that is um, at Grasslands National Park. So um, I stole this banner from my presentations that I was giving for Simply Ag and so Simply Ag has got 13 species and all of these are also found in um, Grasses National Park so I thought it was a nice kind of you many of you have probably seen all of these species as well um, so those are kind of the species we're talking about Sim very similar obviously to what's in Alberta um, you're go okay with me doing yeah, this? Yeah go for it <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, just to acknowledge, we've got a lot of people that we're working with in Grasses National Park. We've got um, producers that we're partnering, partnering with, universities, different um, federal agencies, even in the United States, federal and state agencies, um, and obviously we've got a lot of staff that work at Grasses National Park as well. Um, so I, I'm very sorry I was late. I was hoping to see your presentation, but things didn't work out that way today. So. Um, you may have already said this, that grasslands are one of the most endangered biomes in the world. Have all of you heard that? Even worse off than rainforests? Yeah, so that's, that's what we're hearing now. Um, obviously, northern Great Plains fall into that up here. Um, and there's lots of grasslands across the world, but obviously we're going to talk about northern Great Plains. Um, and specifically, Grasslands National Park, uh, it's east of here, two hours-ish, depending on how fast you drive. You better drive fast to make it <laughs> two hours. Well, I guess <laughs> anyway, I was driving a little fast. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Valmarie's right here, uh, West Block, 
and I live right here, East Block. Um, so that's where I'll be talking about today. And so in Grasslands National Park, there's over 20 species that have been identified as at risk uh, federally. And so they're listed here. The ones in purple text are ones that we actually have specific um, population and distribution objectives for. So I was just going to hand this out um, so that I can kind of show you what we're working with in the park. The black tail is very far on. Uh, not yet. You were there when you when you when you released them? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, ten years ago now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You were the maid for the old man you read. Okay, so this tape sheet of paper that I just handed out um, comes out of our <laughs> multi-species action plan. It's just one page out of, obviously, lost. This is page 48, and there's even more than that. So um, I've marked on page 1 is Appendix A. Uh, and this gives you an example of what we have for our specific population and distribution objectives um, for a few different species. Um, so chestnut color Lonsbury, for example, at Grass National Park, in areas that we're managing for them, we want to see more than 47 males per 100 hectares. Um, and so then we've got some population monitoring that we would do, conduct point counts at least once every two years in critical habitat managed for long spur habitat conditions. Um, and then some general information and the broad approach, improve habitat conditions with managed grazing and prescribed fire. Um, so I'll talk about it a little later, but long spurs like heavy grazing and fire. So that's the kind of habitat that they nest in. Um, fire. Sorry? Did you say fire? Yeah, prescribed fire. Yeah. They like nesting um, in areas that have a lot of bare ground. Yeah. Um, and there's actually a number of other species as well. If I go back to the list. list um, so prairie dogs, <coughs> burring owls, long spurs, uh, shorthorn lizards, uh, mountain plovers, longbow curlews, which counts long spurs, short-eared owls, uh, swift fox a little bit. Um, any of those species like more bare ground, less vegetation cover, so they would benefit from prescribed fire. Um, so, and then if you flip over to the back side, I believe the number two, it's page 48. This is Appendix B, uh, which is conservation and recovery measures for grass in National Park. So this is all for sage grouse, since I'll be talking a lot about sage grouse today. Um, these are specific things that Grasslands National Park has agreed to do for sage grouse. Um, so I'll talk about it in detail. The first one is the Habitat Assessment Mapping and Decision Support Tool. Um, the second one there, Habitat Restoration. I'll talk about that one a little bit as well. Um, best management practices. So that's things like um, taking out attractants for ravens or crows that can decorate uh, sage grouse nests or chicks. Um, and then we've also got at the bottom beneficial grazing practices, um, specifically for nesting and brooding. And so those actually have two different sets of requirements. So we have to be careful about how we're grazing in the park, um, so that we can achieve those habitat targets. Um, so we've got population and distribution objectives again for the, the purple text here. And then also we've got these recovery actions for all of those species with purple text. So I just kind of wanted to give you a really quick rundown on what the multi-species action plan looks like in the park. And I believe it's similar for the sod area because they've got their own. So the South of the Divide area has their own action plan. And the park is obviously in that area, but we've kind of been pulled out because we're a big chunk of federal land. Um, and we've got separate funding and all that stuff. So. Um, they've kind of pulled us out of that sod action plan, and so but this is the kind of thing you might see in a multi-species action plan. Um, okay, so Grass National Park, we uh, attempt our best to take an ecosystem approach, um, and so two species that have been really important for us in our recent history are obviously greater sage grouse <coughs> and black-tailed prairie dogs. So uh, greater sage grouse are people over here aren't going to see this map, um, found all across 
this area of the west. Um, we're um, here, Grass and Central Park is this area here. Their range used to extend this kind of layer green color, so because a lot of this has been converted to cropland, um, they've kind of shrunk down. Um, and now uh, Grasslands National Park, as far as we know, is the only place in Saskatchewan that has active lex remaining. Um, I don't know what it's like in Alberta, but... Um, and there could be some private land that has lex that we just don't know about. Um, so, yeah, so we're working on managing this species. Uh, and then keystone species, so black-tailed prairie dogs are what are called ecosystem engineers. So they are in an area and they really impact heavily that area and they create habitat for lots of other species. So um, I was asked just a couple minutes ago about the black-footed ferret. Um, Grasslands National Park did release ferrets in the park about 10 years ago now. Um, and as far as we know, there aren't any ferrets there anymore and we think it's partly because there just weren't enough prairie dogs to keep their population stable. Um, and so that's one species that relies on prairie dogs. Our burrowing owl population also really likes prairie dog colonies, just they're burrowing owls obviously, they nest in the burrows of the prairie dogs. Um, the range covered this whole area of North America. Um, we're at the very northern tip, kind of, of the known historical range. Um, and so it's pretty important in Canada, since Grass and National Park is the only place that has prairie dogs, that we manage that population and try to keep it healthy and um, self-sustaining so it can stay in Canada for a long time. Um, so with that information, that those are two species that were uh, really interested in. I'll talk a little bit about the conservation status of both. Um, so, greater sage grouse, they're currently occupying only about 7% of their historical range in Canada. They're endangered, and there is uh, an emergency protection order in place for sage grouse, which covers uh, most of Grasslands National Park. Um, uh, this is Lex in Saskatchewan. So, for greater sage grouse, we count every spring. The number of males that are dancing on the legs and that gives us an estimation of their um, population each year and so in Saskatchewan it's obviously got a downward trend um, and so yeah we're pretty concerned about keeping this species in Saskatchewan and Canada in general 